Hello and welcome to week two of our eight-week study entitled Praying with the Gospel of John. Uh, we began last week with a look at the prologue to the Gospel and we'll pick up from there today looking at three encounters with Jesus and what they tell us about Jesus and his mission and what they tell us about how people responded to his message. Let's begin with a prayer. O oh God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature, grant that we may share the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity, your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We began in session one to look by looking at the structure of John's Gospel, and I suggested that the most commonly accepted uh, structure is a four-part structure, uh, beginning with the prologue in the first 18 verses of chapter one of John. In the prologue, uh, John reveals his understanding of who Jesus is and of the divine plan of which Jesus is a part. Then we move on to the, a larger section from chapter 1, verse 19, all the way through the end of chapter 12. This section is referred to as the Book of Signs. It contains uh, Jesus' teaching and also several of his miracles. These are called signs by John because they indicate to us something about uh, Jesus' mission, who he is. So we'll be looking closely at those signs. Uh, in the third section, the Book of Glory, beginning at the uh, beginning of chapter 13 and carrying on all the way through the end of chapter 20. And the Book of Glory is the story of Jesus' last week, uh, beginning with the Last Supper with his disciples and then several chapters of teaching for his disciples before he leaves them, and then the arrest, trials, uh, crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And then the fourth uh, part of the Gospel of John is an epilogue, an additional chapter that was added sometimes later that adds some resurrection appearances and also addresses some of the concerns of the Christian community for whom this Gospel was written. So those four sections, the prologue, the book of signs, the book of glory, and the epilogue. And last week we began by looking at the prologue. And there were several things that were revealed to us in the prologue. First of all, John speaks to us about the Logos, the Word that was with God from the beginning and was God. And it was a participant painting with the Father in the creation of the world. All things came into being through him, John writes. So there is this Logos that has existed uh, all through time uh, from the very beginning with the Father and uh, through whom all things were made. And this word becomes flesh, takes on human form and comes to live among us in Jesus. And this is the mystery of the incarnation which lies at the center of Christian uh, uh, doctrine and spirituality. This word becomes flesh and dwells among us, and uh, because he is from the Father, he is from above, he is able, even though he has assumed human form, he's able to reveal to us the true nature of God. And so the, the uh, prologue ends with this verse, no one has ever seen God, it is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. So this word, existent from the beginning, through whom all things were made, takes on human form and then reveals to us the nature of God. Now, in the prologue, John also introduces a couple of themes. One is a contrast between light and darkness. And he says, 
this word coming into the world and taking on human form is like a light that is penetrating the darkness and dispelling the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. He also says that this word coming into the world uh, provokes a response on the, on the part of the people to whom uh, uh, Jesus is sent. And, and there is both acceptance of this and rejection. So some people are going to resist this light coming in because, John says, they prefer darkness. Other people will accept it and find new life in Jesus. So we have this image from the prologue. It's, it's, I suggested last week that it's as if uh, John pulls back the curtain and allows us to see who Jesus really is. And this is the product of his and of the community's reflection over several decades of time. But this is who they've come to believe that Jesus is, that he is God who has taken on human form and who is uh, revealing to, to them the nature and purposes and salvation of God. And so uh, this, this glimpse of who Jesus is, is then covered up as we move into the book of signs and we see Jesus encountering different people. They don't know what we, the readers, know. We, the readers, have been given this glimpse of, of what this mystery is about, but the people encountering him in daily life don't have this understanding. And so very often we see conflicts between uh, Jesus as, as speaking about things from above, supernatural things, uh, and people are trying to understand him on a very literal, earthly level. And so John has uh, two levels operating. There's the earthly, material, literal level, and then there's a spiritual, supernatural, transcendent level above. And Jesus uh, uh, operates on both of these levels, but sometimes there's confusion when he is speaking from this supernatural level and, and the people are trying to understand him in a very literal way. So we're going to take a look uh, today at three of these encounters, three encounters with Jesus in the Gospel of John. We'll look first at Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Then we'll look at the encounter with the woman from Samaria at the well in John chapter 4. And finally, we'll look at the encounter with a man born blind in John chapter 9. So let's first turn to John chapter 3 for the encounter with Nicodemus. And if you have a Bible before you, you may want to open that. We'll try to project some of the verses here on the screen uh, so you can read along if you don't have a Bible with you. So Jesus is in Jerusalem, and during this time, uh, he is visited by Nicodemus. Nicodemus, uh, the Gospel writer tells us, is a Pharisee, and he is a leader of the, of the Jews. So he is an educated and religious man uh, an or of the order of the Pharisees, and he, he is recognized as a leader of the Jews. What's interesting to note in Nicodemus' uh, visit is that he comes at night, which suggests uh, some ambivalence. Nicodemus is curious about Jesus. He wants to talk with him. He's attracted to him. But at the same time, he has reservations. He comes in secrecy at nighttime. He doesn't want other Pharisees or other people to observe him uh, exploring who this prophet is. And so uh, John's introduction of Nicodemus coming at night is significant here, because remember John has talked about the light coming into the darkness. And here Nicodemus is still uh, uh, lingering in the darkness. He wants to look at Jesus, talk with Jesus, find out a little bit more about it, but he's not ready to come into the light and embrace Jesus yet. And so it's significant that he comes at night. He says to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Now this seems like a very a kind of flattering 
thing to say to open the conversation, but Nicodemus is trying to approach from a, a position of strength. We know that you are from God. We've already decided this. We've, we've made this judgment. Uh, we see the signs and we can attribute those to God. But then he's going to, he's, he's come here not to flatter him. He's come here to test him and to probe uh, more. And so, but he sets himself up from this position of authority first. We know who you are. We know uh, that you come from God. And Jesus picks up right away on this air of uh, superiority, this place of knowledge and certainty from which uh, Nicodemus tries to speak. And uh, Jesus, uh, uh, sensing that this is his purpose, uh, penetrates that by saying to him something very unusual. Jesus' response is, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And the Greek word that is used there in the original New Testament uh, is uh, a Greek word, anothen, which means, has a double meaning. It can mean again. In other words, uh, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again, or it can mean from above. So no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Now here's the first instance in the gospel of uh, people misunderstanding Jesus because they are trying to comprehend him on their own earthly uh, level and not understanding that he's talking about something at a different level. So Nicodemus says, uh, how, how can I be born again? It doesn't make any sense. I can't enter into my mother's womb again and be born again. But this isn't what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about a spiritual rebirth. Can you uh, uh, receive this new life that is coming? Can you be born from above? This is a, a spiritual and uh, transcendent uh, uh, phenomenon that he's talking about being born from above. Uh, it's, and so, because Nicodemus is on this literal level, he can't grasp it. So in the, in the, in, in the face of Nicodemus' certainty, his, uh, we know, uh, his sureness about himself, Jesus proposes a way of not knowing, of being born from above. And for Jesus, that means becoming a child again, uh, a child of God, and to becoming a new person, <laughs> receiving a new life, a new identity, a new purpose, a new set of values. It's about entering into a new life, a life from above that Jesus is bringing into the world. And it's a life that is guided not by knowledge and uh, principles and laws and regulations and rules that Nicodemus is so uh, accustomed with, but it's a life that's responsive to the Spirit and uh, guided by the Spirit. And Jesus is inviting him to become new. We look at uh, the response here of, of uh, Nicodemus. Uh, this is in verse 4, how can anyone um, be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born again? Uh, Jesus answers, truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom without being born of water and the Spirit. And he says, do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. And here comes this spiritual nature here. The wind blows where it chooses. And you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So he uses the example of the wind. We know the wind is blowing. We can feel it. We can see that it has a, a direction. Uh, but we don't know where it's going to go. We can't control it. We can't dictate it. And so uh, Jesus is setting himself up to challenge the, the kind of rigid system that uh, uh, Nicodemus and the Pharisees 
represent and include in inviting him into a new kind of life that is a life that's guided by the spirit so he wants to show Nicodemus a different way uh, but Nicodemus uh, plainly is not uh, ready to understand. In, in verse 12, we read uh, Jesus saying to him, If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? The heavenly things that Jesus is talking about have to do with him uh, being lifted up. And here he draws an analogy from the Old Testament as the people of Israel were wandering in the wilderness and they were struck by a plague. And God told Moses to create a, a brazen a brass kind of serpent and to put it up on a pole, and hold it up before the people. And anyone who was sick would look upon this, uh, this figure of a serpent and they would be healed. And so Jesus uh, pulls from that Old Testament story to talk about his own being lifted up and that's what the Book of Glory about is, is all about, the second half of the Gospel. It's about Jesus being lifted up. And Jesus is lifted up not just in his resurrection, but he's also lifted up all through that whole section of the Book of Glory. So beginning with the Last Supper, through the arrest, even through the crucifixion, while he's being crucified. His crucifixion is a moment of glory. He's revealing God's glory in the crucifixion. He is lifted up, as he says, so that he can draw all people to himself. So in John's Gospel, there's this great arc, this great cycle, this great movement of the one who is above, who is with God from the beginning, who's created all things, and who takes on human form and enters into our human experience. But then he returns to the Father. And his return is not simply after his death and resurrection, but his return begins already with the final week of his life. He said, the hour has come now, and he begins this upward journey where he's going to be lifted up and uh, reveal God's glory on the cross as well as in his resurrection. After this, uh, Nicodemus seems to uh, uh, drop out of the conversation, and uh, Jesus focuses uh, on the meaning of his incarnation. He says that God has sent him into the world because God loves the world. God so loved the world, Jesus says, that he sent his only son so that those who might believe in him could have eternal life uh, in his name. So he sets out the meaning of his incarnation is that it's an expression of God's love. Uh, God so loved the world that he sent his son. And it's an expression of God's love that is meant to be a, uh, an act of salvation. God reaching out to connect, to rescue us, to lift us up, to uh, restore us to uh, the nature uh, which God intended for us from the beginning. And uh, Jesus underscores this by saying he came so that those who believe might have eternal life. And he says, God did not send the Son into the world for judgment. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. And yet, and yet, as we'll see, and as he's already suggested in the prologue, and as we'll see through the gospel, there are some who don't receive him and don't receive this new life because they resist it and they prefer the darkness. They turn away from it. They block it. And so um, uh, we have this uh, kind of judgment taking place. It's not a judgment uh, in which God is saying, these ones will be saved and these not. It's a judgment that's happening quite naturally because of the crisis of faith that Jesus' incarnation brings about. Jesus is there announcing this word of truth, revealing God to them and telling them of God's purposes. And the judgment takes place right now, here and now, by some choosing to reject that invitation and others choosing to accept it. So uh, in, in Christian theology, we talk about this as uh, 
as eschatology. Eschatology is that part of theology that's concerned with death and judgment and with the final destination of our souls and of all humankind. And there are two kinds of eschatologies in the Bible. We can talk about a future eschatology, uh, which is an eschatology that looks forward to the return of Christ and uh, a, a judgment taking place where people will be accountable for their actions before Christ at the end of time. So uh, Jesus anticipated that, the early Christian writers anticipated that, that there would be a coming judgment. But in John, there's also what has been called a realized eschatology. In other words, an eschatology that takes place here and now, right, in, in human life, not at some future point at the end of the world or whatever. Realized eschatology is the judgment that happens in response to Jesus' coming where some people choose to accept him and find new life, and others choose to reject him and to stay in uh, darkness. Nicodemus is an interesting figure because he's both curious about Jesus and drawn to Jesus, and he's also holding back, uh, protecting perhaps his position of status and power, uh, comfortable in his uh, system of religion, uh, unwilling to really open his heart and embrace this new life that Jesus is talking about, the, the life that will come to him if he is willing to be born from above. We see him, the next time we see him in the gospel is in chapter 7. And uh, here are the, the Pharisees, uh, Jesus uh, portrayed here as Jesus' opponents, are wondering, they're trying to debate whether they can arrest him or not. If they arrest him, they, they risk uh, uh, crossing the people and uh, raising the ire of the people. But if they don't arrest him, his ministry goes on, and that leads to more problems for them. So they're having this discussion about whether or not to arrest him. And uh, uh, Nicodemus stands up and says, well, we don't, we don't arrest anybody unless we have uh, allowed them to state their case, allow them to defend themselves. So we read in uh, verse 49 and 50, um, the Pharisees saying, uh, saying that uh, uh, he needs to be arrested. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus before and who was one of them, that is, he was one of the Pharisees, asked, our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they're doing, does it? But he's immediately shouted down by the, uh, the Pharisees who replied, Surely you are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and you will see that no prophet is to arise from Galilee. So we have a small speaking part for Nicodemus here. He seems to be uh, defending Jesus and saying, We don't judge people without giving them a hearing. Uh, but he's quickly uh, shouted down by, by the Pharisees who are eager to uh, persecute uh, and uh, trap Jesus. The second time that we see Nicodemus uh, following this opening story is in chapter 19, and this is after the crucifixion. A man called Joseph of Arimathea, who is a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one because of his fear of the Jews. This is in John chapter 19, verse 38. Joseph of Arimathea is a disciple of Jesus, but a seeker one for fear of the Jews, of Jesus' opponents. Asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed the body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices and linen cloths and uh, buried him in a tomb. So uh, Nicodemus is a, is a shady figure in John, just like Joseph of Arimathea. The disciple, he wants to be a disciple, or he shows interest in being a disciple, but he's not named as a disciple. He's, 
he's, he's preferring, like Joseph, to remain in, in secret, to not uh, uh, come out publicly. And this may be because of his position, of his wealth, his privilege. Uh, it may be because of his security in his own religious system, and he's not open to this new truth. Let's turn to chapter 4 to look at Jesus' encounter with a woman from Samaria. Jesus comes at midday. He's traveling back to back north to Galilee now, and uh, to get from Judea up to Galilee, he has to pass through the country of the Samaritans. The Samaritans were uh, a, another religious group who uh, had origins in Abraham uh, and, and the faith of Israel, but had diverged and now represented a slightly different religion with different uh, places of worship and different customs. And the Jews uh, of Judea and uh, uh, the rest of Israel held them in contempt. So Jesus is, as it were, passing through enemy territory here. The Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. And he encounters at jo Jacob's well, he encounters a woman who is there drawing water at noontime, which suggests that uh, she is uh, not an accepted member of her community. Normally, women would come to the well early in the morning, in the cool of the day, to draw water. But this woman comes alone by herself at noontime, um, uh, which suggests that she may be a bit of a black sheep. She's not, uh, not uh, part of the group of women that come together. Uh, but Jesus... Uh, enters into dialogue with her, and by doing so, he violates the social norms of, uh, of the Jews. He, as a religious teacher and uh, as a faithful Jew, should not be participating in a conversation with her, should not be initiating this conversation. And so he's breaking the social norms that uh, have been kept under the Pharisees' tradition, uh, uh, their code of conduct that maintained uh, some people as pure and other people as impure. He's, he's entering into a conversation and asking uh, a drink of water from this woman who is definitely outside the realm of the pure and the righteous in Jewish faith. But here again, we see a misunderstanding. Jesus uh, uh, asks her for a drink, and then he says that he is able to give her living water. And with this living water, she would not have to return to this well again. <laughs> now, that's a confusing word for her, because just like with Nicodemus, Nicodemus couldn't understand what being born again could mean. He couldn't imagine going back into his mother's womb. So he couldn't comprehend what Jesus was talking about on a spiritual level. And this woman is saying, I, uh, you can't uh, draw water here. You don't have a bucket and the well is deep. How are you going to give me this water? But of course, Jesus isn't talking about literal water. He's talking about a spiritual plane. He's talking about her spiritual thirst and quenching her spiritual thirst. And he's talking about the gift of the Spirit, which will become like living water uh, bubbling up within her. So he's promising her new life. And uh, this um, Christians uh, have always interpreted this as a, a, a reference to baptism, I'm talking about a spring of water that's welling up to eternal life in, in her. So uh, she continues to uh, misunderstand him and not be able to comprehend what he's talking about. And then Jesus switches tacks and gives her a sign by revealing a part of her past. He says to her, you've had five husbands, and the man that you're with now is not your husband. And so in, in John's Gospel, Jesus is both very human and very divine. And we see the divine Jesus operating here. He has insight. He can tell her something about herself that he ought not to know. And he perceives about her or knows about her uh, in some mysterious way. And she's so struck by this that she's willing to grant that he's a prophet. She recognizes him as a prophet. And uh, because she recognizes him as a prophet, she gives him a, a religious question. 
since we we Samaritans worship here and the Jews worship in Jerusalem, uh, which one is the best place to worship? It seems like a diverse uh, diversion, a kind of tactic to keep him from probing too much into her personal life. She asked this uh, uh, question about the right place of worship, and Jesus doesn't. Uh, uh, doesn't dismantle the, the Jewish understanding that uh, worship is to take place in the temple in Jerusalem. He doesn't uh, uh, criticize or undermine that, but he, at, at the same time, he talks about a new life and a new Israel and a new worship um, that will not be dependent on locality, but will flow from the spirit of truth that he will give. And finally, the woman uh, realizes that she, she may be, in fact, talking to the Messiah. And she runs back to her village, uh, leaving Jesus, and uh, to, to get her, uh, the people in her village to come out and, and meet him and see him. And she's such an effective evangelist that they come out and they speak with Jesus. And after they speak with Jesus, they say to the woman, your testimony was valuable, but we believe not just because of your testimony now, but because we ourselves have seen and know this truth. So the gospel writer says, um, many more believed um, because of what Jesus said to them. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. So how unusual for Jesus to come into enemy territory, as it were, to come among the Samaritans, and then to have this response of people accepting and believing in him, uh, accepting his word as truth and coming to believe in him. Um, yeah. whereas he is receiving opposition from his own, own people. It's interesting to think about the contrast between Nicodemus and between the woman in chapter 4. Nicodemus is wealthy, he's powerful, he's secure. He comes to Jesus saying, we know who you are. Uh, uh, the woman is, is not in a social position of power. In fact, she is, seems to be an outcast in her own village. And yet, she's open to receiving this invitation that Jesus is offering her to a new life, uh, a life that will quench her deep uh, spiritual thirst and uh, will be like a spring of water that wells up to eternal life within her. A biblical scholar, Gary Berg, writes this. There is a link between spiritual receptivity and the degree to which we are settled into a system of life and belief. The greater our comfort, he says, the less our chances to receive a new word, a transforming word from God. And this may be what we see in Nicodemus, someone who's comfortable in his system of life and belief, doesn't want to be challenged, doesn't want to risk coming out of that for something so unpredictable and so uh, unknown uh, as what Jesus is offering him. Let's take a final look at a third encounter here in John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, we see Jesus... Uh, this is the book of signs, remember, and this is one of these signs that he is doing. John chapter 9, he, is, uh, he comes across a man who has been born blind. The, the story opens in chapter 9 with a, a question from his disciples. Jesus is asked, uh, did this man sin or did his parents sin? Whose fault is it that he is blind? And Jesus assures his disciples that it is neither the man's fault nor his parents' fault that he's been born blind. And he says this blindness is uh, for the glory of God, uh, uh, anticipating what he's about to do. Then we have this story unfold in several scenes. Uh, this is important uh, because uh, 
the Messiah that was anticipated in the prophets, for example, Isaiah, was someone who restored sight. So this is a key story for John and, and part of his evidence, a sign that points to Jesus as the Messiah, that recalls Isaiah's words. Isaiah had predicted that the Messiah would be a light to the nations and would open the eyes of the blind. And this chapter is all about that. It is showing uh, how this blind man came to see because of Jesus and not only received physical sight, but also spiritually had his eyes open. Whereas the, the Pharisees, Jesus' opponents, who, who claim to be able to see, uh, uh, are portrayed in this story as the ones who are actually blind. So let's look at it scene by scene. The first scene in the first seven verses we have Jesus encountering this man who's born blind. He makes uh, dirt, uh, mixes dirt with saliva, and he, he smears this mud on the man's hand, and he tells him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And when he does, the man regains his sight. So the first scene is the miracle itself. Uh, Jesus mixes this mud, tells him to go and wash, and when he does so, He's healed. A second scene opens in, in verse 8, verses 8 through 12, where uh, the neighbors question this man. His neighbors see him and see he's able to see now, and they say to him, how did you uh, come to see? You're, you're the man that we know, right? You were born blind. How is it that you're now seeing? And the man's response is, a man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and told me to wash in the pool of Siloam, and I received my sight. So he, he refers to the one who has healed him as the man called Jesus. And he says, I don't know how it happened. This is what he did to me, put mud on my eyes, told me to go wash, and I was healed. Uh, he has no explanation for this, and no, no reason uh, for why Jesus did this, or how Jesus did it. But he says, it's the man called Jesus who did this uh, for me. The third scene brings the Pharisees into the picture. And as I said, throughout the Gospel of John, through much of the New Testament, the, the Pharisees are consistently portrayed as Jesus' most outspoken critics and opponents. And so the, the Pharisees interrogate the man and they say, what do you say about Jesus? And uh, he, they press him uh, on what has happened to him. And he says in response, he is a prophet. And we see he's saying, he's not just a man called Jesus anymore. He's a prophet. Uh, he, the, the man uh, whose sight has been restored, recognizes Jesus as a prophet. The key to the story comes in verse 14, when we realize that all this was done on the Sabbath day. So it's not so much that Jesus healed this man that the Pharisees are objecting to, it's the fact that he healed him on the Sabbath. And this, uh, this is a violation of their uh, understanding of uh, maintaining purity. Uh, work was not to be done on the Sabbath. This is a violation of the Sabbath law. And uh, Jesus is, uh, has raised their uh, opposition by doing this on the Sabbath. The fourth scene has the Pharisees going to the man's parents, beginning in verse 18, verses 18 to 23. The Pharisees interrogate the man's parents. They say, this is your son, isn't it? How is it that he can, that he can see? The parents are willing to confirm the facts. Yes, this is our son, and yes, he now sees, and yes, he was born blind but they're afraid to offer any interpretation. And the, in, the, in the scene itself, in uh, verses 18 through 23, the reason they give is uh, for their reticence in speaking anything more than just confirming the, the basic facts uh, is that they are afraid. Um, so it, they say to the Pharisees, we know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees. 
nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. The gospel writer adds to the note, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said he is of age. Ask him. Now this uh, raises another interesting note about this gospel. I remember in the first uh, session, we talked about this gospel being written toward the end of the first century in the year about 90, and uh, Jesus' death occurring sometime around the year 30. So there's a long uh, period of time. And during this period, as the Christian community becomes more and more consolidated, more clear in what they believe, and more distinct from their fellow Jews, uh, the tension builds between Jews who have received Jesus and those who have uh, not accepted Jesus as the Messiah. There's no indication in Jesus' own lifetime, even though there were uh, some Jews who opposed him, and notably the Pharisees, uh, there was no indication that any of his disciples were at risk of being uh, cast out of the synagogue or denied entrance to the synagogue. Uh, this is a development that is later historically, and uh, historians uh, uh, anticipate that it may have been as late as 80 or 85 that this, uh, this kind of uh, persecution escalated and that uh, Christians were no longer allowed to worship in the synagogues as Jews. So uh, it's interesting to note that this, this bit of information, this insight, is woven into this gospel. So it's not historically uh, appropriate to this time, but it does reflect that the author is writing to, uh, to a group of Christians who are undergoing persecution and who understand this fear on the part of the parents. And so he's acknowledging that and uh, acknowledging the risk of uh, declaring an allegiance to Jesus um, in, in the present day, at the time that he is writing. Scene 5, uh, beginning in verse 24, the, the Pharisees interrogate the man a second time. And this time he defends the man, saying, if, uh, this time the man who has been healed says, uh, if Jesus is not from God, if he is not from God, he could do nothing. And so he comes to Jesus' defense and he affirms him once again as a prophet who is come from God. And uh, he's beginning to uh, side more with Jesus, identify more with Jesus, and defend Jesus against Jesus' critics. The interesting thing about this uh, is particularly in verse 33, um, the, the, the man says, if this man were not from God, uh, he could do nothing. The Pharisees then answer in verse 34, you were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. First of all, it shows some of the contempt of the, the powerful religious leaders for the uneducated. Uh, you, you were born in sin. You have nothing to say to us. We don't we don't count your uh, opinion or your uh, about this man. Uh, we we know best because we are the educated and powerful ones, and we interpret the law for you. So it kind of it shows the kind of disdain that the Pharisees uh, uh, showed toward uneducated, a contempt for the unlearned. But it also shows uh, here and they drove him out. So here is a, an example of exactly what his parents were afraid of. They drove him out. Uh, and uh, uh, what's, what's beautiful then is in the following verses, beginning in uh, scene six in uh, verse 35, Jesus heard that they had driven them out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? That's a beautiful reference there, isn't it? He's driven out by the Pharisees, told not to come back. You don't belong here. And when Jesus hears about him, he goes looking for him. The good shepherd uh, 
looking for this sheep. And when he found him, he asks him if he believes in the Son of Man. The man says, and who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus says, you have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. And the man answers, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. So we see the blind man not only regaining spiritual his, his physical sight, but also uh, becoming spiritually, uh, regaining spiritual sight. He's no longer blind uh, spiritually. He sees who Jesus is. He's come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So it's, uh, it's interesting to contrast this man's faith and the spontaneous worship that comes from him when he acknowledges Jesus as Lord, when compared to the hypocrisy and the blindness of Jesus' opponents. Jesus says he is the true son of Abraham because he acts as Abraham acts. And he points out with kind of Johannine irony uh, that, uh, that the, the Pharisees who assume they are seeing and who uh, supposedly teach others to see uh, are the ones who are in fact blind. The Pharisees answer, uh, uh, respond by asking him, uh, surely we are not blind, are we? And uh, Jesus uh, claims that they're, they're even worse than blind. They will not see. They refuse uh, to see uh, the truth that's right before them. So the story began with a declaration that physical blindness is not caused by sin, but it closes with the declaration that spiritual blindness is caused by sin and by a stubborn refusal to accept the truth. So we know through the story, the response of the man. First of all, he says, the man called Jesus healed me. And he says, he's a prophet. He's from God. And finally he says, Lord, and he comes to believe. So uh, those are three examples of people who responded to Jesus in the context of the story. The Samaritan woman and the man born blind coming to be believers and followers of Jesus. Nicodemus in a slightly different category. It doesn't say that he was uh, part of the opposition, but he also doesn't sacrifice his position as a Pharisee. He seems to remain with the Pharisees and he's willing uh, to, to help bury Jesus and to make a generous contribution of uh, spices for that purpose, but he's not willing to come to Jesus and not willing to identify openly with Jesus. He prefers the security of, of uh, the remaining with the Pharisees in their uh, tradition. So I invite you to our suggestions for prayer. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Next week, we'll continue to look at this book of signs, and we'll look at some of the signs and wonders that Jesus does in the book of signs and to see what they indicate about who he is and why he's come into the world. Thanks again for joining us.